Hi guys, my name is Ryan Chaw. I'm a pharmacist turned real estate investor. And you might be wondering, how did I get into real estate investing as a pharmacist? Well, let me tell you, it was definitely a long journey. Uh, it all started out with my grandpa, who invested in the San Francisco Bay Area back in the 50s. Now, my grandpa encountered a lot of racism back in the 50s. He actually had a lot of doors slammed on his face because back then there was some racism against Chinese immigrants that were coming in. But he was able to get a set of six flats in San Francisco, and he bought it very cheap, somewhere in the $100,000 range. And over the years, the price went up like crazy, and he was able to rent it out to six tenants, one tenant per flat, and the rental income was not only able to pay part of my college tuition, but my brother's as well. And so I realized that real estate is really one of the best ways to create generational wealth. So when I started working as a pharmacist, I wanted to get into it as soon as possible and buy as many as I could at the time. So I started out with buying my first single family home back in 2016 for $262,000 and it was in Stockton, California. And from there, I basically just saved up a lot of money working as much overtime as possible. I would actually get in to the hospital at 7.30 a.m. and I would typically work until 10 or 11 p.m. at night. We called them double shifts because you would literally be working two shifts at the same time. By the way, guys, if my voice sounds a little rough, it's because I'm just getting over a cold, so I apologize for that. So after I bought my first property, I had a lot of issues that came up with it. I had a sewage line break on me. I've had uh, to replace the HVAC. And it, all in all, I lost over $30,000 on the first property. It was kind of a nightmare at, at the start of it. But I knew that real estate was one of the best ways to build generational wealth, as seen from my grandpa's great example. And so I wanted to keep at it. And I knew... One thing's for sure is that I never like to give up. I persevere. I see there's obstacles that come up and I go through them. I always make sure I do the best that I can and I stick with it until the very end. So basically what I did was essentially to buy one property per year. Very simple, very doable for me, especially since I was working a lot of overtime and I was working two jobs at the time. Now, what really made me successful was the unique way I approached real estate. I rented it out by the bedroom versus as a whole house. So this typically meant taking a three bedroom, two bathroom house and then converting it into a five bed or six bedroom, two bathroom house. And every bedroom I would rent out for $600 to $700 per month, which is kind of the going rate for off-campus houses or off-campus bedrooms at houses. And if I had a six bedroom house, that would be making anywhere from $3,600 to $4,200 depending if I charge $600 per room versus $700 per room. So it's a very simple strategy to bring in a good amount of rental income. Now, what's really great about this is I was purchasing properties in the high $200,000 to low $300,000 range, at least back in the day. So my mortgage payment was typically anywhere from $1,500 a month to $2,000 a month. And if I'm making $3,600 a month in rental income, subtracting out a mortgage of $1,500 a month left me with about anywhere from $1,500 to $2,000 per month after subtracting out miscellaneous expenses and all of that. So it was really one of the best strategies out there renting by the room. And what I did is I rented it out to college students at my alma mater college where I went to pharmacy school because I saw my friend doing this when he was in college and he rented out to his friends. And not only was he getting housing for free, he was also making cash flow and money on top of it. So I was like, wow, what a really great strategy. I should try this too. If he can do it, why shouldn't I be able to do it as well? So I basically continued buying houses until I got to five or six in the same area in Stockton, California. And then I started experimenting with buying in different cities. So I went to Sacramento and eventually I went out of state, which is another story. But the most important thing is that I found a niche and I stuck with it. So you might want to know if you were getting started and you don't have any rentals and you're just, this is your first one 
and you wanna just get started as soon as possible, how can you make this strategy work for you? Well, there's a couple key parts to the strategy to make sure that you find a great rental with a good amount of return on your investment. So the first thing, using this particular strategy is I invest near top colleges. So I will go to Google and look up the US News top colleges in the state that I'm interested in. And I will go through those colleges and see what type of graduate programs do they have? Do they have medical degrees? Do they have pharmacy, dentistry, nursing? Do they have science degrees like engineering? Do they have computer science? Do they have MBA, which is the business degree? Do they have potentially a law degree like a JD? Basically, I figure out what graduate programs do they have because most of the people that I rent out to are graduate students. And how this works out is usually colleges provide housing for undergrad students, but they don't provide any housing for graduate students. At least a lot of them do not. And so you have this list of, I would say, 2,000, 3,000 graduate students that don't have any housing provided to, for them from the campus itself. So they have to stay off campus. And so this is a great tenant base to have because they're really focused on their studies. They probably had straight A's or are very well-rounded and they really wanna get that doctorate degree. So most of the time, they're not focused on trying to throw a wild house party or something like that. They really wanna be studying for their medical exams or for the MBA or their JD, et cetera. Now, the second thing you need to do is you have to buy very close to the college itself. So I typically like to be within a walking distance or biking distance to campus. But if you can't be within walking distance, at least be within a five minute drive of the campus. Uh, that way you ensure that your rental is always desirable for students because students, when they wake up for their 8 a.m. classes, they want to be as close to the campus as possible. Next, the third thing I would say I look for is I want to make sure that the house is a good enough size that I can put in those extra bedrooms. Typically, I look for a house that's over 1,500 square foot because I use the rule of 300. If you divide the total square footage by 300, that gives you the number of bedrooms you can have at a house. So 1,500 divided by 300, for example, is five bedrooms. 1,800 square foot divided by 300 is six bedrooms. So I usually look for, again, 1,500 square foot houses or greater so that I can get five or six bedrooms at the house. That way I can really maximize the amount of cash flow that I bring in from the college rentals. Finally, the last thing you need to know is what neighborhoods are really popular for students. And for that, I really wanna go by word of mouth because when you ask a student, where did they find housing? They probably talk to their upperclassmen and ask for advice from the upper uh, college students. And so they basically rely on word of mouth to figure out where they want to stay for off-campus housing or the most desirable locations. And so the best place you can go is something called Reddit. I go to Reddit, I type in off-campus housing, best places to stay and the university that I'm investing in. And then basically look through as many posts as I can to find what are the areas that students really talk about? For example, there could be something like Little Italy. Make sure you stay in Little Italy. And so what I do is I'll plot on the Google map where are these high in demand neighborhoods. And then whenever a house comes up in that neighborhood, I will go ahead and purchase the house. Because I know if I say, hey, we got this place in Little Italy, the students are gonna already know that word in their head. And they're gonna go like, oh yeah, I remember Little Italy. That's the place that my friend told me I should probably stay in if I ever stay off campus. So that's the basic strategy I used. Now you're probably wondering, how did this play into my pharmacy life and how did it affect me as a pharmacist? Well, what's really cool is I was able to retire from pharmacy completely at the age of 31. Now, I've worked as a pharmacist for eight years and I could always return back to it at any time because I still have my license. But what's cool is I was able to actually replace my pharmacist income around year eight of working as a pharmacist. So I basically have the choice to retire and be able to pursue other passion projects that I have. So one of these projects is teaching others how to do this strategy because it was so impactful for me and it basically made a huge difference in my life. I was able to teach a lot of other people how to do this strategy. Uh, currently, I've taught over 60 clients how to go from 
doing everything from studying the market demand. And that, for example, is going to Reddit, calling up apartments, figuring out what local occupancy rates are, doing the research and talking to the students directly by asking them what rent are they willing to pay and what is their budget? Because students have a very specific budget in their heads. And even if you're like $20 over that budget, they'll say like, oh no, that's outside of my budget. I can't afford that. If you just go $20 down, let's say your original price is $670 and the student's budget is $650. Once you say, okay, well, we can do $650, that student is all of a sudden like, oh, that fits my budget. So we can go ahead and move forward with it. So you have to realize there are certain key aspects to this that are very important for students. Things like affordability, safety. If the parent came over and saw where their kid is staying and they drove from your house to campus, are they passing by any rough neighborhoods? Would they feel safe to, uh, knowing their child is driving from your place to the campus? Like, does it feel safe? Is there a lot of trash everywhere? Is there a lot of homeless people walking around? You know, that type of stuff. Finally, of course, we mentioned before that students are also interested in convenience. How close are you to campus? The proximity to the campus. And then the last thing is they want to be staying with other students as well. So as long as you present yourself as student housing only and you're only accepting students, then students feel comfortable staying with other college students. In fact, they might feel uncomfortable staying with non-college students. So basically that's the market research, that's the market analysis. And then you have to go through deal analysis, which involves looking at like the top three deals and what are the pros and cons of each deal then we have to figure out okay how do we renovate these properties so that we can add those extra bedrooms finally we have to market the property and then we have to know how to manage it or put in systems to manage the property now a lot of people ask me what's my life look like now most of my time most of my day is spent on training my team so now i have a team of virtual assistants whom I trained how to market, manage, take care of compliance issues at the house. So what this looks like is they reach out to students, they talk to the current tenants and make sure that the place is being well kept and making sure that there's repairs uh, that are being handled on a timely manner. And most of the time I just have meetings with these virtual assistants contractors and lawyers to make sure that my business is running smoothly. Um, I currently have 15 properties and 90 tenants, and it's of course making multiple six figures in rental income. And so my focus now is on just building the systems and processes and really working on my leadership skills or being a good leader for the team that I have. And a lot of what I learned was how to be humble, how to really put aside my ego and do what's best for the company and also learn how to take responsibility. Because at the end of the day, if you are the landlord of a property, you are responsible for whatever happens at the property. It doesn't matter if it's not directly your fault. At the end of the day, the buck has to stop with someone, right? So at the end of the day, the landlord does have to take responsibility. Even if it seems like you don't want to do it, that's how extreme leadership and extreme ownership works. Now, you might wonder what I do in my free time. Well, I go to jujitsu five to seven times a week, and I really like to keep fit, keep healthy. I like to visit my family. I actually see my parents twice a month, and we go to movies, or we might do an escape room together. I swear we've done at least 30 escape rooms so far. Um, it's just kind of a hobby we do. And I like to travel a lot with my family and with my girlfriend. A couple places I went to, for example, were Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, China, and a lot of places in Europe like England, France, Germany. I've been to love some local places as well like Mexico, Belize. By the way, if you ask me what's my favorite two places to ever have visited, I would say Belize is one of them and Japan is another one. Those two are definitely at the top of my list. Finally, you might be asking, okay, this is a, a great success story. What would you have done differently if you were to go back and talk to your 23 year old self? What I would say to that is I would pretty much do everything the same way, almost the same way. And that's because all the mistakes that I made along the path have gotten me to where I am today. And I have such a deep understanding of 
how real estate works because I made those mistakes. So I really wouldn't change too much. However, the one thing that I probably would change is if I could, I would focus on building the back end of my business earlier. So around the fifth house or so, that's when you really want to start having some teams behind you. So for me, I hired some virtual assistants for the marketing, for the management. I had somebody for the bookkeeping. I also have an accountant, lawyers realtors, lenders, and contractors. So real estate is really a team sport. I think that's the one of the biggest takeaways I learned from real estate. And so building up the team and the back end of your business earlier, I guess after, I would say around the fifth house or so is uh, so important to do. And that's what I probably would have done a little bit differently. And that's my story, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below if you have any questions for me. Please also like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. And I will go ahead and see you guys on the next video.